All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us uh, and listening to Dr. Nelson today. Um, I just want to let you know that we are taking questions, which we will be taking through the Q&A function of Zoom. Uh, we also have a hashtag on Twitter, hashtag ethical questions. You can join the conversation that way. This conversation is being recorded and it will be available uh, later today on the Hastings website. And I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Mildred Solomon, who is the president of the Hastings Center, who will uh, introduce Dr. Nelson. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to, to welcome you. I, I, um, I'm the president of the Hastings Center. Hastings is known to many of you, but not all. It's a bioethics research institute focused on the wise use of emerging technologies and on compassionate and just health. You are an audience of researchers and university faculty from many different disciplines, bioethicists, policymakers, and members of the general public. That's a very eclectic mix, and it's on purpose, by design. Because Hastings believes that ethical questions should not just be deba debated among experts, but that we have an obligation as citizens to engage in, in public discussions about the choices that we face that have ethical significance in science and health. Our focus today is on genetic testing, especially direct to consumer genetic testing, including its intersection with race. And we're going to turn to that topic in just a moment, but with more than 500 of us all gathered today for this event, I think it's important and I'd like to start by acknowledging the broader context in which we find ourselves. We all know we're at an exquisitely painful moment in the history of our nation. The pandemic, unconscionable levels of economic inequality and racial discrimination, even hatred, are tearing us apart and calling on us to find a new way forward, a new way to trust one another. Our topic today of direct-to-consumer genetic testing is narrow in comparison. It's narrow in comparison to the numerous threats to our democracy and to the powerful forces that are undermining the well-being of huge numbers of our people. Nevertheless, the topic is important and it's relevant to any discussion about race in America, which is the kind of discussion all thinking people should be having right now. Furthermore, quite by accident, and it's a lovely accident since we invited her nearly nine months ago, which seems an eternity, our featured guest, Professor Alondra Nelson, is a sociologist of science who's been studying racial politics for decades. So I know she'll have thoughts about our national dilemma as well as the primary topic of this session. Currently, there's great interest in genetic testing mainly to identify rare medical conditions and risk factors for common for common conditions. Uh, for example, at the Hastings Center last year, we issued a major report on the growing interest in sequencing all newborns. Our authors of that particular report cautioned against offering sequencing on a population basis to all newborns, but believe that it would be a beneficial diagnostic tool for sick newborns. Likewise, we're getting ready to publish guidelines on whole genome fetal sequencing, the use of sequencing in the prenatal period. But genetic testing for purposes like those, like in the medical context, pale in comparison to the commercial sector, where direct-to-consumer testing has really taken off. Today, tens of millions of people have given DNA samples to a handful of companies, and the results are being used in many settings, many settings from criminal justice to genealogy, and many in between. Professor Nelson has studied direct-to-consumer testing for more than a decade, including an extensive analysis of the use of DNA testing and ancestry research by the African-American community. Her insights will have implications for all of us as potential consumers of these tests, and also for the field of bioethics as we, as our field seeks and or should seek to develop sufficient guidance for the use of these tests beyond the healthcare sector, something that we're working, we aim to work on at the Hastings Center as well. So our time together is gonna to be structured like this. Dr. Nelson will be making some introductory remarks for about 15 minutes. 
then she and I will continue a discussion between us that you get to listen in on, and then I'll open the door to all of you for questions. Please write your questions down at any time in the Q&A function, not the chat function, in the Q&A function. And then Ben, who you just met, will be reading those um, and he'll let me know what you'd like to ask. Now, to start, let me introduce Professor Nelson more formally. She is president of the Social Science Research Council, which is one of the most esteemed roles anyone in the social sciences could hold. And she is also Harold F. Linder Professor at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Her research explores questions of science, technology, and social inequality. She's the author of The Social Life of DNA, Race, Reparations, and Reconciliation After the Genome, and also a book called Body and Soul, The Black Panther Party and the Fight Against Medical Discrimination. And she's also co-authored two other books, Genetics and the Unsettled Past, The Collision of DNA, Race, and History, and Technicolor, Race, Technology, and Everyday Life. Alondra? Hi, Millie. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. I know people are, are um, joining us from, from all over, so whatever time zone you find yourself in, thank you for being with us and thank you for that introduction and the invitation to be here. I, um, you didn't mention in my bio that I'm a Hastings Center Fellow, which um, also is a, a, a great distinction um, of which I'm, I'm very proud. Um, so thank you for those uh, opening remarks as well that really set the necessary context for this conversation. Um, uh, you know, my perspective for a long time on how we think about ethics, genetics and ethics and bioethics has really been one that comes out of studying for um, over 20 years now, uh, black people, black communities, engagements with science and technology, and really taking that space as um, uh, a way to move forward to think about what we might want bioethics to do, what a new paradigm for bioethics to be. Um, and, you know, the kind of question that I've been kind of grappling with in the context of this over the course of my work is really, you know, how and, and why has it been the case that um, communities that have been uh, the objects of scientific scrutiny, of technological surveillance, of what Harriet Washington calls medical apartheid, how do folks, you know, find space to be subjects and agents and powered people in science and medicine. And I think at its best, that's what bioethics hopes to enable um, individuals and communities to do. So as you mentioned, um, and I wanna raise it because uh, we're gonna talk mostly about the, the work that I've been doing over the last um, now probably 15 years on genetics and direct to consumer genetic ancestry testing. But I wanna begin by saying a little bit about my book, Body and Soul, which is about African-American health activism in the 60s and 70s, because um, it is a moment at which um, concerns about police brutality, concerns about what we now call racial health disparities, concerns about medical discrimination were all articulated by local communities as something that that were interrelated um, and were something that were that needed to um, draw that needed to something to draw national attention. Um, so uh, you know part of what I uncover in body and soul is um, communities who had a, a very um, I think nuanced discourse about what it meant to engage mainstream medicine. Um, they understood that over time, black communities had been quote unquote, in their words, guinea pigs for scientific research, for clinical research, um, that in the course of both research and medical care, that there was um, inhumane treatment, unnecessary death, settled suffering and care. Um, and that it was not always from a perspective, and I think, um, uh, to being mindful of this moment of a perspective of victimization that part of the story um, that I'm able that I had the, the sort of great honor to tell here um, is really about um, how communities uh, sort of sought to find a way forward and that included finding a way forward as scientists as medical researchers as clinicians right against the backdrop of this very pernicious um, history of medical and scientific discrimination. Um, and, you know, also in this particular moment, um, in the backdrop of something like a research center um, that was trying to make spurious connections between black people's biologies and violence, right? That was, and it was harking to the violence of the 1960s and 70s to say, 
uh, you know, to make racist claims about um, black people's bodies uh, as being sort of the, the source of, of protest. Um, and, you know, Jonathan Metzl's work on the protest psychosis um, sort of carries um, some of this discourse and conversation forward as well. This was also a moment when, like today, attention was drawn to medical neglect of incarcerated people and their particular, particular vulnerability to the predation of risky research and also uh, of neglect for, you know, basic services that they need. Um, so, and to Millie, to your earlier point, it was also a moment and when, uh, at which, um, you know, local communities were also engaged in trying to advance newborn screening as a way to combat um, genetic diseases like sickle cell anemia that disproportionately impacted communities of, of, of African descent. And lastly, I want to say about this work that it really prefigured and profound ways this activism, um, a kind of language that has become a commonplace in this moment of COVID-19 around racial health disparities. Um, the members of the Black Panther Party and their allies, um, you know, came up with a very early framing for racial health disparities. Um, but the disparities for them were not about um, uh, about disparities in, in data necessarily. They were about disparities in resources. So as they talked about sickle cell anemia and advocated for attention to it, the disparities they raised were disparities in research attention, research resources, and philanthropy tropic resources um, for study and investigation of the disease. So, um, you know, it's sad that, uh, you know, what was passed is present once again, um, but I think that we've got a role to play in making a different future. But I just wanted to, um, I think, given your opening comments, sort of suggest that, that these are issues that we've been having um, in our community of social researchers for a very long time. So more recently, as you mentioned, I spent a decade studying um, the first years, the, the sort of emergence of a, a new um, startup industry, direct-to-consumer genetic testing. Um, I was interested in uh, the ways that it, it was um, being marketed and particularly to African-American communities and that it also had particular appeal to African-American communities based on uh, the, the history of those communities and the history of racial slavery. Uh, and and I was also interested in the fact that the people that I spoke with very early on, um, mostly in the US, but to some extent in the UK, were making their own, were, were left to make their own, and were also making their own um, cost risk benefit analysis, right? And so there, there was like, you know, there was a, people were left to sort of decide for themselves, is it riskier to participate um, and this emergent form of genetic taste testing um, that might lead to further surveillance. Um, people I talked to as early as the early aughts were already drawing connections to the criminal justice system and where the data might go, drawing connections to other uses outside of the genealogical uses that they intended that it might be used for. You know, could one, um, for example, you know, Achieve, you know, um, get data about one's um, healthcare, uh, you know, health status um, based on uh, genetic data for, gene for genealogical purposes and the like. And, and those concerns coming out of uh, consumers are what brought me to the concept of the social life of DNA. And an idea that I think um, brought me to also want us to imagine a new paradigm for thinking about genetics and ethics together. Um, and uh, to, uh, to a, a few things. Um, so for this moment, I think that there's, um, I wanna capture for us and, and bring to the conversation about bioethics that there's a tradition and black life that really prioritizes the care of the whole person. So if there is something like a black bioethics, it's not never only about the medical, um, that it, it, it always includes issues of justice and power. Um, uh, Millie mentioned justice. Justice, of course, is one of the core pillars of bioethics as we think about it in a formal sense. Um, it, to my mind, is a moment, it's long been a moment to push on and really lead with the justice imperative of our bioethics work and to understand that um, from Nuremberg to, you know, to Belmont to now, um, that the principles, the pillars themselves were not wrong, but that our focus really needs to be not on static principles, but on how we think about them and contemporary social, technical, political, in the context of changes in, in, in science and technology and politics and the social world more generally. 
um, and that I want to offer that we need a, a sort of braver bioethics that is a paradigm that would go beyond um, uh, medicine. So I just want to offer two examples, one from how to that, that you know, to help us think through um, what we're facing here. So one is from direct-to-consumer um, genetic ancestry testing itself formally, um, which we saw there early on did not sit in the space of ancestry alone. Indeed, some of the early testing um, would provide, you know, 23andMe starts with doing um, sort of medical predisposition and then goes to ancestry testing. And so the testing and its uses are sitting all together. More recently, we've had um, quite a few controversies still unresolved and frankly still unregulated in which direct to consumer um, uh, genetic communities and third party applications that are created really in the spirit of citizen science for people to cooperate together um, uh, have been used uh, by law enforcement officials and the criminal justice system. Um, and, you know, so part of what I think that we want to think about is um, a paradigm or paradigms that really anticipate that things like this were going to happen. I mean, you know, as I said, when I was interviewing people in 2002 and 2003, it was somewhat speculative, both by the part of both scientists and um, lay people and consumers, but it was not out of the realm of possibility that something like this could happen. And the question becomes, you know, what was and what is the role for bioethics and for conversations about justice and ethics to be, um, you know, getting ahead of, of these kinds of situations. So, um, so I, I think that, you know, part of how we think about um, our ethical considerations are really about the individual and what direct to consumer genetic testing really brings to the fore for us is not only that fundamentally we're all connected, um, but also that bioethical issues really have to take on, I think, in this new moment, a kind of network sensibility or a kind of um, a sense, an understanding that we are um, uh, sort of in community that there are things and risks that are sh that are both to that are harm potential harms to individuals, but also potential harms to communities that we should think through. Um, one of the uh, some of the research that's been most important to me in thinking about this actually has been a Hastings um, Center report essay by Dina Davis in 2004, in which she talks about communal narratives about, about ethic, about genetics, and um, the fact that if we're thinking about genetics and genealogy, that um, more than the individual are always implicated. And so how do we think about the role of bioethics when it's not in um, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, sort of liberal individualist framework um, only. Um, and, uh, and how do we think about sort of ethical questions that are not only, as I said, about um, med medicine narrowly and not only about doctors and patients and their interactions or clinical researchers and their research subjects, but about a lot of different stakeholders, including known and unknown biological relatives government, industry, um, and citizens. Uh, so I would love to, to sort of take up that conversation. And then um, a little bit, a word about ancient DNA. So part of what I trace in my book, The Social Life of DNA, is um, the early efforts before we get to even a decoding of the draft of the human genome to use these technologies as they're just emerging to answer kind of long-standing historical questions. And in the case of African-Americans, for, for many, it was sort of where are the original homes of, the, of, of African Americans? Um, and one of the early sites where we see this play out is um, a, uh, a, a cemetery um, in Lower Manhattan called the African Burial Ground. It's now the African Burial, Burial Ground um, National Monument. Um, it was um, uh, in the 18th century called the Negroes Burying Ground, and it was a segregated bury, burial ground in, in Lower Manhattan. And some of the issues that we saw play out there, I think, were um, uh, kind of touchstones, I think, that to be taken up for how we might think about some of the new dynamics that are brought to play by ancient um, DNA analysis. Um, so, for example, who, who gets to decide, you know, whether or not remains can be used um, to file down a little bit of bone and make that analysis. Um, if we were thinking in the context of Native Americans and of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, or NAGPRA, um, we might say it is the community to, you know, that claims to um, be related to that person, um, as the, was the case with the Ancient One, um, or also known as the Kennewick Man, of, uh, and, and the, uh, in Washington state. And so 
uh, in the case of the African burial ground, it was the local community that says, we don't know who these people are and we seek to know who, how we are related to our ancestors, but it's our role and we should have a seat at the table and thinking about and, and talking about, you know, how this research should be done, um, who should do it, uh, what questions should be asked, and indeed what questions perhaps should not be asked of this research. And so given the extraordinary um, research, uh, you know, and technological change in ancient DNA testing, all of these questions become more urgent and more acute. And then there are new questions as we have more and more papers that come out and say, um, you know, this community thought they were this thing. And now, you know, our research suggests that there may be, you know, uh, in a kind of genealog in a genetic way um, should be understood as, as this identity. And so I think there's responsibility there to think about um, in the way I think that it that the, the bioethic tradition as it be, at its best at, at its best brings together stakeholders to think about how we want to proceed in our work and also how we want to proceed with um, ownership of remains decisions about whether or not um, remains that are uh, um, are actually quite rare um, you know who who should be able to grind a little of those down and do the research? When is it not a good decision to do so? And who gets to decide? Or is it only ever the decision of an individual research researcher, given that we know that the research is going to yield claims um, about a larger community? And when, and in the past, you know, we might have brought that community to the table and in the conversation more downstream. And I think there might be a responsibility now to um, do that more upstream in the conversation. So I will stop there, having thrown out a few provocations, and um, I look forward to the to the discussion, Millie. Thanks, Alondra. Let let me follow up on that. That this is a, a great a great launching point. I also just want to mention that I see that people are raising their hand using the raising your hand function, but we're not using that function. So if you have questions, jot them down under the Q and A function. And then Ben will roll those all up and we'll, ha and we'll be able to use them um, in, in a few minutes. So Alondra, thank you. Um, I, was, I was very taken by, by your book, The Social Life of DNA. And so I wanna kind of unpack some of what you said and really drill into it. Just let's start very simply. What did you mean by the social life of DNA? So the social life of DNA is, is um, like, you know, two meanings. I really was following um, what genetic ancestry testing did in the world. So where did it travel? Um, and so initially I was interviewing in the, in the research, I was just interviewing people who had done the test and they were, you know, it was a little bit before and after. So how do you feel before the test? How do you feel after the test? Um, and it became clear to me very early on in my research that what was actually important here, and this goes back really to your introduction, you know, your comments about it being narrow was actually not that that was that it was not narrow because it was traveling all over and that people were making all sorts of different uses with the results that I think many of us could not have anticipated. So the sort of step to, um, you know, I, I thought I was, you know, European American or African American, and I now have learned that I'm uh, inferred to be Scottish or Igbo, um, you know, was only the very beginning of this whole wide world of circulation and use uh, of those tests. So that's one of the ways that it's the traveling of the use of people's tests, the social life of the, of the DNA ancestry test results. And then the other was, of course, the, as, I'm, as I was discussing earlier, that kind of spillover in which the ancestry results come to be taken up in the forensic, um, you know, in criminal justice system, um, and which uh, ancestry results are used in, um, you know, medical testing. Uh, indeed, um, uh, when if we think about something like the the um, the all of us, uh, the precision medicine initiative, and the all of us enrollment. I mean, some of the strategies there have been to use um, genetic ancestry testing as a kind of threshold to involve people. So it's about um, the ways in which the uses of, although they might be very narrow for those of us who are scholars, they kind of travel in the world in ways that are quite seamless. Um, and I think that, that many of us didn't uh, anticipate that. And then more recently for me, the phrase has also really come to take up um, the datification of, of, mm -hmm. of 
of genetics more generally. Um, so part of how this traveling can take place is that, you know, any genetic data, uh, you know, genetic samples can be made into data and the sort of original intent doesn't matter if one can use the data and data sets and, and lots of other social sites that weren't originally intended. So it's really to, um, the social life of DNA is really to sort of take up that whole sort of, you know, all of these movements kind of taking place at once that are really distinctive to um, the last 10 or 15 years. What do you think is, it eth is ethically at stake given this traveling DNA, that it has such a vibrant social life and shows up in many different contexts? What's, why should bioethics care? What are, what are the ethics stakes? And so what should consumers yeah. work out too, I, related? And what are the ethical stakes, not just for scholars, but for, for consumers? That's great. So, uh, I, so on the, I think for bioethics in its most nor narrow sense, and so I know that that's not all of bioethics. I mean, I think the stakes are really that, you know, we, that, that we have worked in thinking about bioethics as being about doctors and patients, clinical researchers and subjects, and, and kind of biomedicine per se. And that the social life of DNA suggests to us that that very narrow kind of social, the thinking of where the space of, of genetics and ethics set, sits is inadequate for what's actually happening in the world. And so if bioethics is to be relevant and useful, um, it needs to actually venture that kind of circulation and how the thinking um, works. But the stakes for consumers are, um, I, I think, are, are becoming more clear. Um, you know, when we think about something like GEDmatch, which is the third party um, application that I was referencing, that was, you know, was before it was sold to a, a forensic technology company um, about three months ago. Um, you know, it was a quite incredible thing. You know, folks could take their data from various different companies, they could upload it to GEDmatch, they could help other people find each other. Um, that kind of um, uh, sort of ethos or way of doing work is actually very commonplace in genealogical communities. So these kinds of, you know, surname studies, there's been all of these um, kind of fascinating communities around trying to, around the project of self and familial discovery um, and the use of genetics to do that. Um, and I think what, with consumers, and we know from the news reporting that signed up for this third party app, um, they didn't anticipate that the criminal justice system was going to be using their data. Um, they signed up to help other genealogists do their work. And so the ethical stakes there are really about um, not giving people, I mean, it's not exactly informed consent, because again, Millie, as I said, it's not medicine, but people cannot be making informed decisions um, about even cons their consumption and where they want to put their data if, 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 you know, those of us who should have anticipated this can't tell them that this might be a possible outcome of their um, participation. So you're asking bioethics to expand its scope. Absolutely. To anticipate the additional uses of what starts off to be one purpose and, and travels. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you, you had a wonderful line in, in the, well, you had many wonderful lines, but one that really stuck out for me is you said, direct to consumer genetic tests give scientific shape to human yearning. And I take you to mean to a, a universal human yearning to understand where one has come from and who one is as, we tend to define it through geography and culture and history. But then you wrote on just a few pages later <laughs> that genes are a socially anemic conception of human identity. So it represents and gives scientific shape to human yearning, but it's an, an anemic conception of identity. Could, how do you reconcile the, those, those two statements? How do you see that those working together? Sure. Yeah. So I think that we, you know, that I, that, that human relationships and human identity um, are uh, a kind of big cauldron, a big stew of stuff, um, you know, and as a social scientist, I understand that part of that stew is who we say we are. So, you know, we take our $99, we take our $349 and go to a company, make a decision, and you know, it gives us an inference, um, you know, good, bad, right, wrong, or indifferent, that we, you know, we have purchased, you know, our aspiration has brought us there. We paid somebody to tell me who we are, and darn it, it's gonna tell me who I am. Um, so there's that piece of it. 
But that experience um, really has nothing to do with how social identity is sort of lived in the world. So I could take a test that gives me an inference of, um, you know, a hundred percent, you know, uh, Indian subcontinent identity. Um, however, if I'm not understood to be that person in the world, either because of um, my, you know, my food ways, my culture, you know, how I look in the world, then that those two things are not you know, kind of working together. So to say that the genetic piece is, social, so, um, is socially anemic is to say two things. So for me, I think, unlike some of my colleagues, I, I do actually think that um, people's engagements with direct-to-consumer genetic testing are socially important, and it's why I spent 10 years of my life studying it. So I don't disregard it and, and think that it's, uh, you know, um, insignificant. Um, although I think there's a lot of critique around what it does and does not tell us. But I think it's socially anemic in the sense in that identity is about what's ascribed to someone and also what they aspire, what other people say they are, um, the, where you live in society and, and, and how your various other identities besides ancestry sort of intersect together to um, sort of give you a social location, social role, place you in various kinds of hierarchies. Um, so. I want to, for me, it's not a paradox. I mean, I, I, it is, in fact, it's a, it's more like a feedback loop, right? Yeah. So it's that um, all of the, the sort of historical social locations, kind of people's intersecting identities and their sense of aspiration for something more, something fuller, something additional is what brings them to the testing experience. Um, and then they get additional data, but that additional data doesn't necessarily change a lot of other things in their social world. So it's um, it's a, a kind of ecology, um, and and the, the 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 genealogy piece or the genetic piece is is one part of a, a very wild wide world. We run the risk, I think, of weighting genetics so much more than we weight other factors that contribute to who we are. And you had a story at the start of the social life of DNA that, that illustrated that beautifully, the story of Venture Smith. And I thought maybe you could just, you know, because we had all this information about his life, historical yeah. information about his life that really told us who he was. But no, that wasn't enough. We were going to dig him up and get his genes too, as though that was going to add some information. Could you fill in people? I think it's a really excellent moral tale. Just a little of yeah. the details of what I'm re referencing. So the, I should, so Venture Smith, um, thank you for that, Millie, was um, an enslaved man um, in the 18th century and um, around what is now East Haddam, Connecticut. Um, he uh, would buy him, purchase himself and his family um, out of uh, slavery. Uh, he be he would sort of do the backbreaking work of an enslaved person, and then would spend extra time, uh, you know, to the extent that he could, um, saving money. And so he became a free man late in his life. Um, and so he's important historically for that reason. He's also important because he's one, he's the author of, or the author working with, a, um, you know, an ab abolitionist kind of um, amnesis. Um, to write a slave narrative uh, about his experience. And his experience goes to the continent of Africa. So it's not, you know, um, one of the, the, in the genre of, um, of slave narratives that are about people born um, in, the, in North America. Um, he's actually born in what we think is contemporary Guinea. He tells us the name of his parents. He tells us about the village that he lived in. Um, he tells us about the Middle Passage journey um, on uh, a ship that was captained by um, a fairly notorious uh, captain who would become um, infamous for uh, throwing off um, enslaved people off of a ship to get the insurance on the, the another ship called the Zong um, that's um, historically important and well known. Um, and so both because he had written this story about his life um, and also because, uh, you know, he's a really important historical figure for the, the state of Connecticut. So there's been a lot of um, state genealogy, a lot of history devoted to him, a lot of uh, resources. And moreover, um, unlike many people of African descent in the U.S., members of his family, because he's so well known, many of them know each other. So in East Haddam, Connecticut, every fall, 
um, at a, a congregational church there. There's something called a Venture Smith Day and members of his family you know, fly from all over the country uh, to really commemorate their ancestor, to lay a wreath. There's also, you know, there's often um, uh, some reading from his, his, um, his uh, narrative uh, and the like. So I had been um, following the Venture Smith story. I was teaching at Yale University at the time and East Haddam is just up the road a little bit and was, became very interested when his family, who I came to spend some time with, uh, made the decision to um, allow researchers at U at the University of Connecticut to exhume his body um, and part to find out where he was from. Uh, and so here you have a figure who, um, a historical figure who, about whom we know more than most historical figures of this time, regardless of their, their historical background. And yet we thought genetics could tell us something more. Um, so in the end, the case fails. They're not the, you know, it might be, we might be able to, if the family allows it again, be able to analyze his remains and, you know, a few years, maybe if the technology gets better, but there weren't, um, there wasn't sufficient um, remains there to, to do the investigation that they wanted to do in the end. But I thought that it was a very telling exercise about the, I think, our overinvestment in genetics and the power of genetics to, to tell us who we are. Thank you for sharing that. You've also pointed out that when one gets a genetic result, it's not only about oneself, it gives enormous information about others. And so in a sense, it is about the collective as well as the individual. And I understand that there was great African-American interest in ancestry research pretty early on for the, in, the, in the pursuit of uh, learning about one's his individual historical roots. But I know also that the evidence that's being provided through these tests can be directed towards um, collective social and political action, what you called acts of reconciliation in the book. Can you tell us, you know, even I'm going to ask you what those acts of reconciliation are, but first, what's the evidence that one, what's the collective evidence that's being tur turned up and then how is it being used? So the, the collective evidence, I mean, I think one of the, how I try to think about the, the test results is that um, beyond the kind of identity piece is that African Americans, in, in my case in particular, um, for a very long time had been saying, you know, the legacy of slavery is not distant. It's close to me. Um, I think, argue, you know, that are, there are ways in which, um, uh, you know, life in the U.S. And, the, and globally for Black people, the forms of structural inequality and racism, the kinds of police, police brutality that we people are rightly protesting um, uh, in the streets today, uh, has everything to do with that, that particular um, legacy. Um, and, but I think sometimes, you know, for other people who don't, um, I think, understand the African American perspective or experience, seems like something that was long ago. How should this have any bearing on the present whatsoever, right? So I think we are having, we've had various societal moments of awakening around that um, not being true. And, and, and this is one of those moments. Um, and so I think the tests sort of make it, make it closer, right? I mean, to be able to say, um, whether or not the tests themselves provide this information, which is something else, uh, but to be able to use the test and leverage the test to sort of say, I'm you know, very close to um, my ancestors from Africa who were brought here as enslaved people. And thus what you understand, you a kind of royal you, um, to be a kind of distant phenomenon is, is very close and the implications for it are very close. And, and thus I think it can be, to your point, Millie, mobilized it, um, and to um, contemporary politics, uh, as opposed to being a, a sort of historical knowledge that sits in the past. It, these tests um, are leveraged politically to sort of give life to debates, issues um, in the contemporary moment, um, whether or not the, the tests themselves are reliable. Well, it would, I, we're, we're getting a lot of questions and we're going to pause in a minute, but I can't resist just a little more detail on this. It strikes me that when you get these results, you can learn about your patrilineal line and you can learn about your matrilineal line. And too often, is am I right, that African-American results would show European patrilineal line and uh, an African matrilineal line suggesting 
what we know happened during periods of slavery around rape and other um, uses of black bodies. So has that been a significant part of what is being determined and how people are thinking about evidence that can be made for reparations, for example, or other forms of reconciliation? Sure. So the, the published data um, suggests that uh, for the the, pet, the, um, the Y chromosome testing for African Americans, it's about 30% European um, uh, um, uh, patrilineage. And so, um, so for many of the people that I've spoken with, I mean, that's confirming of something that they've already known. But it's different to sort of assume that that history of sexual violence um, and rape that was endemic to slavery and part of actually how the, you know, was a part of an engine of slavery, frankly, um, was historically true. It's another thing to, um, uh, you know, receive an inference that says that, that you embody that very history. Um, and, and it bring, it's a, that's a different kind of, I think, psychic reckoning with that past, with that violent past. Um, and then I'll say a little bit about the, the reparations case, because one of the things that was um, that one, you know, that I was able to uncover or uncover to me, it was, you know, people were doing this in the world. So it wasn't a mystery to them. Um, when I, fought, I started to follow the uses of the test was very early on um, a, a class action suit for reparations for slavery. Um, this is in 2002. So this is before ta Coates writes his very important essay um, on the cover of the Atlantic, a cover story for the Atlantic in 2014. It's before um, more recent contemporary um, and necessary conversations about reparations. So these were people who um, had been longstanding reparations activists and bring a class action suit called um, Farmer Paleman versus Fleet Boston. Um, uh, around 21 multinational corporations that still exist today. Um, you know, the suit claimed based on um, proceeds variously that were made through uh, the enslavement of people of African descent um, here in the United States. And um, the court, you know, sort of one of the things the court is trying to um, weigh is whether or not the eight plaintiffs in the class action suit were the injured parties um, to whom restitution would be owed in a kind of tort law framing. And um, the court says, you know, you can't really demonstrate standing and the, lawyer, the, the, the activists and their lawyers go back to the drawing board um, and decide that they're going to sort of introduce into the conversation of their appeal brief their direct-to-consumer genetic testing results. So this is in 2004. This is um, very early in the market. Um, this was a time when I believe there were only three or four direct-to-consumer ancestry testing companies um, in the United States at all. Um, one of them was Family Tree DNA, that's still going strong, and I believe was the first in the U.S. Um, and the other was a company that I study closely called African Ancestry, um, which is uh, still in existence today. And so, you know, I think what's fascinating about that case is how quickly um, to think about the, you know, the, the genealogical aspirations and the, the sort of political um, utility of genealogical aspirations, how quickly that happens as early as 2004 um, in a, an appellate court case in Chicago to sort of to, to make the claim that we do have standing as the descendants of slaves. So this doesn't, um, it's not successful in the end, um, in part because all sorts, I mean, there's all sorts of reasons. I mean, genetic ancestry testing is really a operates on the scale of the population. It's not really actually about the individual, particularly when you're talking about, well, just more generally. Um, and, uh, and so, and it was also kind of very early days in the, in the, the science um, uh, in the industry as well. But really an example of, um, I think, uh, of that, to go back to the, a little bit of what I said in, the, the, in my remarks, I mean, that kind of constant, the sort of bioethics of the everyday um, the, you know, a kind of tradition of bioethics in African American communities in which there's always this cost benefit analysis and that the risk of um, maybe not knowing where one's data is going um, might be worth it if one can advance a, a long standing kind of pursuit for justice. Thank you. Ben, I know you're out there in cyberspace somewhere and I know you've been reading a, a multitude of questions that have been coming in. So Ben, do you want to summarize a couple of themes and um, put, put it yeah. in the form of a question? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've had a lively uh, question section. So thank you very much audience for that. 
Um, there's a lot of interest about uh, this provocation that Dr. Nelson suggests around a braver bioethics. And people are curious, what does that look like for you, Dr. Nelson? And what does that look like as one that, as you said, prioritizes justice? And there's kind of two threads of this in this research orientation. What do you believe are the most important questions bioethicists should be asking on the one hand? And on the other hand, how might this intersect with how bioethics research is funded? Oh, oh, I like the last. I hadn't thought. I'll, have to, I'll be thinking on my feet about the last one more particularly. But these are great questions. So thank you, everyone, colleagues, friends, for this engagement. So you know, a braver bioethics. Um, you know, part of the the answer is in the the question that Ben laid out, which is about prioritizing justice and being willing to do that. I mean, I, I for for my experience, because I'm not. Um, you know, a, a philosopher, you know, I, I, I write, you know, I'm engaged in social theory, but I'm not a philosopher or, or um, well, let me not say it that way. I, I think for me, a braver bioethics is one that um, is not content to deal with um, kind of abstract principles only, um, that the principles are our marching orders. The principles are not the ethics themselves. And so what does it mean to think, take things like beneficence and justice and sort of live those out in the world in a very specific contemporary context? And that may mean more protections for some, greater access to funding for others in a way that's not, you know, um, uh, uh, a sort of equal playing field, but that brings resources and justice to people who need them most. So for me, that's a braver bioethics. It's also, um, I think about getting, being willing to um, stake a claim upstream in research projects and research questions. So not waiting till new technologies are developed um, and saying, well, we've got this technology or we have this, the new, this new capability, um, you know, how now should we be thinking about it? Um, you know, how is there a way for people who want to engage in the work of bioethics to um, you know, pound our fists on the table, demand for ourselves and for others, and particularly community stakeholders, a place at the table in the beginning of the research, right? That um, is willing to say, maybe the research should not go forward. So um, uh, uh, a colleague in science and technology studies um, named Langdon Winner, who's, um, who teaches at RPI has this, you know, he testifies before, um, uh, an LCE uh, congressional committee on, on the ethical, legal, and social implications of nanotechnology in 2004. And, you know, the, one of the, the things he says is that, you know, um, one of the problems that I see, this is, this is a kind of paraphrasing him, is that bioethics never says no. So a, a braver bioethics for me would also be a bioethics that says that, you know, this research should not go forward. Um, it is, it's much too dangerous and doesn't wait until um, it's well out of the gate to make those decisions. Uh, and then for funding, I mean, I think the, um, implicated in that is that there's research that should not be funded, you know, because this is a no. Um, and there is research that should be abundantly funded um, because it can have maximum benefit to, um, you know, the least of us and then having maximum benefit to the least of us have maximum benefit for all of us. Thank you so much, Alondra. That was a, a really wonderful response. Ben, another topic? Have we lost Ben? You're muted, Ben. Sorry about that. Um, there's also some questions about regulatory structures uh, around genetic testing. So, uh, you know, folks are wondering how, you know, the social life of DNA kind of spilling over our neatly constructed silos, how that kind of interacts with how we regulate um, protecting uh, medical information through HIPAA, um, how that intersects with employment discrimination through GINA, uh, and then also how those kinds of, as, as Millie uh, mentioned, that, that you have mentioned, how my G DNA is also my sister's and my parents, how that intersects with um, things like life insurance and long-term care insurance, which are outside of GINA. So let's, let's try to break that down and just start with what, what kinds of oversight are there for direct-to-consumer genetic tests? Uh, less than I think people would, less than, less than you think, less than yeah. you'd imagine. Um, and so, and this is in part because, and, and I specifically in my remarks use the language of, the, of a startup. I mean, we need to understand that this was a, a startup industry um, and that 
part of the point, much like many startups, was the disruption, the disruption of regulatory framework. So it's not an accident that we don't have, um, you know, almost, uh, let's see, you know, 15 years, 18 years down the road with this industry, sufficient regulatory structure, because in some uh, regards, that was a feature, not a bug of starting a new industry, you know, to get around, um, uh, you know, medical, I think, um, regulatory structures, for example. So we certainly have regulation of um, things like, you know, laboratory reagents. There are things about the process of direct-to-consumer genetics that are regulated, like the, the CLIA Act that regulates sort of standards and laboratories. Um, but um, genetic direct-to-consumer genetic testing doesn't fall under the genetic, um, you know, Anti-Discrimination Act, the GINA Act of 2008 um, that Ben mentioned. And um, it falls also out of the, you know, it falls through the cracks of something like HIPAA. So there's really actually not quite, there's not really any protection for people at all. Um, and, you know, as I said, you know, the data can really travel anywhere. And even if the intention was not for the data to be um, used for medical purposes, if someone wanted to, they could. Um, and, but that doesn't then trigger, um, you know, HIPAA regulations. And so I think that, um, let me use a metaphor. I, I think much like the, the way that something like the crisis of climate change requires that we think about, um, you know, planetary or, or at scale ways of thinking about regulation, coordination, that's not just about the nation state because the issue itself is not just about the nation state. What I'm trying to suggest here is that um, the way that genetic data travels in the world really requires not just people who understand themselves to be bioethicists or, you know, medical sociologists or sociologists of science like me, but I think, you know, all of us in different sectors to think a lot more nimbly about what ethics might mean in this moment. And so this is where, excuse me, I think that the conversation around genetics, ethics, and direct-to-consumer testing has everything to do with a growing conversation about data ethics and data justice for mm -hmm. forms of data that have nothing to do with genetics whatsoever. So what I'm, you know, so I think what we need to be moving towards is, um, you know, a, a kind of way of thinking about ethics that, that is tied to the medium or the modality of the knowledge rather than the social site in which it originally sat. Terrific. Thank you. Um, Thank you there, there was a there was a question uh, that that came through um, asking about the intersection of DTC genetic testing and people with disabilities. And so this question uh, asks, how can we think about categories of diseases, disability, race, and gender in a more uh, intersectional way? Oh, that's a great question. That's a fantastic. Thank you for that question. I mean, I, I, again, I think this is another one in which the the question in the in somewhat it contains its answer. Um, you know, the, this intersectional uh, approach is, is critically necessary to thinking how, about how this kind of testing and the particular risks of the testing as the data circulates um, differently bears on, on people based on how they're differently socially located, including, um, you know, privilege or lack thereof, access to resources or lack thereof. Um, and of course, uh, the, I'm so glad that the question of disability was raised because that's a, a particularly acute vulnerability with regards to genetic data. So, um, so ancestry data that might um, reveal information about, you know, medical predisposition or medical condition that also reveals, therefore, something about a particular disability in the wrong hands is, you know, obviously deeply dangerous. I mean, the medical information <clears throat> more generally that circulates without um, people's, and you know, and um, and consent and intent um, is dangerous. But of course, um, the particular vulnerability faced by um, uh, dis you know disabled communities and um, differently abled uh, people in our communities is is um, you know deeper and more profound. So I would just you know underscore I think what the this really fantastic question um, suggested is that we indeed need um, an intersectional approach. The, the one thing I would say is that there are, in thinking about having the intersectional approach, I think it does also matter um, to one of Millie's earlier questions, what it is that makes people interested in the first place in the testing. And so, 
Um, so part of that intersectionality, honestly, is also about the particular historical trajectory, different from African Americans than it is, say, for Native groups, different for adoptees, um, differ, different from donor-conceived children that bring people to um, a volitional, because there are, are, are there encounters that are not volitional, a voluntary encounter with genetics um, is also worth, uh, I think, um, considering as part of an intersectional approach. Ben, one last question, if there's still another one out there. One uh, sure. Yeah, um, so I think s someone asked, uh, there were a few reports before COVID took over all of the news um, back in the end of 2019 that there is a decrease in sales of DTC uh, DNA testing. And they're wondering if you think that this reflects a, a, a different kind of orientation towards it or if kind of public interest is cooling off or if this kind of industry is maturing. Um, what, does, what does this mean? I have new concerns about privacy, for example, with data sharing between, you know, big tech companies and hospitals kind of giving people cold feet, um, perhaps finally. Yeah, oh, very good. All these great questions. Um, thank you so much. So there's a, I think we don't quite know. So I think all of the things that you um, brought together in that question, Ben, are all po possibly, possibly playing a role here. Um, but I'll, I'll speak a little bit out of a, the book project I'm working on now, which is on um, sort of science and technology policy in the Obama administration. And I'm writing about big projects that the um, um, Obama administration and particularly the Office of Science and Technology Policy in that time endeavored. So I've been very interested in, um, as I mentioned briefly, the Precision Medicine Initiative and the All of Us um, enrollment, which is the, the, the actual project to um, get a million Americans DNA um, and a, you know, a database that can be used for, for federal research um, and to do so safely, ethically, and to do so in a way um, based in part on complicated you know, I think complicated, but true in some ways, justice claims overrepresenting for communities of color that are typically underrepresented in this kind of research. Um, so one of the things that's very interesting is that, you know, President Obama announces this new research and one of his final state of the state, uh, state of the union addresses, but it's not, you know, it's two more years or so before the actual enrollment into the project begins. And in that interregnum, we get Cambridge Analytica such that in many of the news stories in which um, people are being interviewed and asked about the rollout of all of us, they're bringing up, you know, breaches of, you know, tech company data. They're bringing up Cambridge Analytica, in addition to bringing up the Tuskegee syphilis study and other forms of well-known research abuse. And so I do think to the questioners or uh, many questioners point, there is this kind of convergence around um, concerns about surveillance, about data, about data security, about who one can trust to keep their data secure, um, intersecting with how we think about genetics. And so I think um, uh, uh, that there, and, and this goes, I think, to my bigger point about the, our questions about genetics are really also questions about data in this moment and about data ethics and, and data justice. Um, put those in big scare quotes because I think there's there's lots to be said there. So that I think that the decrease in sales might be about market saturation. Lots of folks have done the test by at this point, um, but it also might be about concerns about privacy and also these increasingly um, well-known cases in which people's uh, you know criminal justice cases in which people's data an aggregate is being used by the criminal justice system without their permission. Well, it, I want to thank you so much, Alondra, and the audience. This, we are now at 1230. I'm afraid that we might be cut off in mid-sentence. I just want to say that I think it is a beautiful example. This discussion is a, is a wonderful example of what the Hastings Center tries to do, which is to recognize that technologies are not just neutral. They're not just about the technical design of the, of the technologies. They exist in an, in an ecosystem, so to speak. And they will, can bring benefits, they can bring harms, they can be used in unanticipated ways. And that it's important for us as thinking people to anticipate how we can deploy them best and how we can, how we can forestall any uninten unintended negative consequences. This, is a deep, this has been a deep dive into one area that you've studied for a very long time very illuminating and really, really helpful. Thank you so much.
really, Thank it was you. really fun. It was fun. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.